And let's go ahead and have our first speaker introduced by Jessica Payne from the Psychology Department. Thank you, Jessica. All right. Um, hello, everybody. So it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Yak Pongsep, Distinguished Research Professor of Psychobiology Emeritus at Bowling Green State University and the Bailey Endowed Chair of Animal Wellbeing Science for the Department of Veterinary and Comparative Anatomy, Pharmacology, and Physiology at Washington State University's College of Veterinary Medicine. If I can say nothing else, I just have to say that one day I hope I have a title like that. <laughs> it's too heavy. It's a mouthful. Very impressive. Uh, Dr. Pongskep is an inspiration to me, really, because he just he does it all. He's a psychologist, psychobiologist, and neuroscientist who's published hundreds of articles in the important and relatively new field of affective neuroscience, a term I believe he coined. His focus is impressively broad and includes understanding how separation responses, social bonding, social play, fear, anticipatory responses, and drug craving are organized in the brain. Today, we're lucky enough to have him here with us at Notre Dame as our first conference speaker. His talk is entitled Social Emotional Systems of Mammalian Brains and Vicissitudes of Early Social Bonds, the Transformation of Social Delight to Grief, Depression, and Despair. I'm sure you're as eager to hear him speak as I am, so without further ado, please give Dr. Yaka Panksep a very warm welcome. Thank you, Jessica, and thank you, Darsha, for organizing this meeting. We should have a really grand time because it's a topic that's close to all of our hearts and hopefully the world will follow. Uh, the reason I got into this field was because I was dissatisfied with my training in clinical psychology in the early 1960s. Uh, no one was talking about emotions, human or animal. And now I'm the director of a center for the study of animal well-being, uh, partially because I'm one of the few people in America that takes animal emotions seriously. And what I mean by seriously is that they actually have emotional feelings, and they are related to our own. And I follow uh, this conclusion on the uh, grand footsteps of uh, the person we're, in a sense, honoring today, who gave us not only a way to look at the evolution of the body, but the evolution of the mind. And he said that uh, the difference between the mind of other animals and human beings is a matter of uh, quantity, uh, but there's a continuity in mind. So I decided that the only way to understand human emotions was to study animal emotions. Our brothers, sisters, nephews, cousins, way far back before the Pleistocene. So this is my uh, map or kind of representation of Paul McLean's contribution of a triune brain. We've got ancient brains inside our own brains. And you have taken an evolutionary perspective to emotions and the mind. There are layerings, evolutionary layering. is the only organ you can see these of any of the fantastic organs we have. You can see the layering in the brain. And there's also a mental layering. And in order to understand our complexity, we have to understand the foundations. So these affects, these mysterious mental things, provide the comfort zones by which all of us live our lives. They are foundational. So our cognitive apparatus tends to follow our feelings. So do these guys have feelings? Well, here's uh, Mark Beckoff, and he's written wonderful books like Emotional Lives of Animals. And he says, it's a waste of time to ask if dogs have feelings, because obviously they do. Now, that's the dilemma, saying they do, but not having a strategy on how to study how they're actually put together scientifically. Uh, what are the mechanisms of emotions? And uh, many people uh, close the door. Nico Tinberg, and wonderful as he was, one of the fathers of ethology, said, because subjective phenomena cannot be observed objectively in animals, it's idle to claim or deny their existence. 
It's outside science. And he said this on page four of his wonderful book in 1954. Uh, now, I think he's making an accurate statement with respect to animal behavior. It's always an inference. You have to have a sophisticated neuroscience before you can work out the mechanisms of affects. There's no other way, and that's why I got into the field 40-some years ago. Of course, here's the sin that we commit without neuroscience. But as soon as we have neuroscience, we can skirt this sin, and a lot of people don't understand the epistemology or the ontology. Here's one of them. Who said uh, emotions are excellent examples of the fictional causes to which we attribute behavior? And uh, he was led by another colleague, uh, John Watson, a bit of a rascal, but I won't go into that. Ah, <laughs> uh, they, they gave us radical behaviorism and uh, gave us wonderful tools, but gave us the wrong ontology and the incorrect epistemology to understand emotions. So if you don't have the tools, you should maintain your silence. <laughs> These are the vicissitudes of early 20th century social bonds in science. They percolate down to the present moment. In other words, my clan of behavioral neuroscientists will not talk openly about the emotions of other animals, even though they have the tools but because of the preaching that went on for a century about the impossibility of studying the nature of the mind, the book was closed. It's still closed, pretty much. So that's how the animals lost their feelings in 20th century science. That's a tragedy. All we initially had, or now what we inherit, is ruthless reductionism. And ruthless reductionism essentially means that you can study everything you need to study by stimuli and behavior. External world, this means you can leave evolution out of the ball game. I'm sorry. You know, that can't be the case. But all of a sudden, the brain came in only in the early 70s because of the cognitive revolution, took all the jobs. Behaviorists had to become neuroscientists. <laughs> That's where the money was. That's a historical lesson. But the mind was left out of the equation. Of course, we are not ever going to see it. It's invisible. It's a neurodynamic. And you have to use indirect approaches comparable to what the physicists use, where they're ultracyclotrons, looking for Higgs bosons, things like that. We have to look for the affects with a very similar indirect strategy. And once we have it for the animals, that will apply to us. And any intelligent person has to listen to the evidence and say, our little babies have profound feelings, because that's what the science indicates. Because all the other young animals we know have profound feelings. Why? Because the emotional circuits in the brain mediate rewards and punishments. That's the catch. They are not neutral. They serve as rewards and punishments, which essentially means the animal felt something. So anthropomorphism might not be all that bad, but you have to take a critical approach to it. And uh, instead of saying fear-like behaviors, I think we have to talk about fearful feelings. I capitalize fear for a very special reason, not just emphasis. And that's what this book was based upon, the attempt to get at the true nature of the mental world. Of course, we only have judgments about the world, so we can make these two assertions, but we also have those same judgments. And where do we stand? If the red and the dark don't match up, we have an error. If animals have no emotional feelings, uh, but our judgment is they have emotional feelings, that's a type one error. On the other hand, if the true nature of the world is the animals experience emotional feelings, but the animals don't have, then we have what they call a st type two error. We try to avoid errors. So this is valid anthropo 
denial. They simply don't have what we have. We're special. We have a cortex of such massive proportions that it can weave together affects. But you know, that's not where our affects come from. There's not one iota of evidence that's solid for the James Lang theory of emotions, namely the percolation of the body into the neocortex generates the idea of an emotional feeling. And after 120 years, we still believe it, in psychology at least, academic psychology. There's no evidence for it. So this would be in the place I think we should be based on evidence. And I think uh, he might enjoy the debate. And I think he would be on this side. There's enough statements in his books that he would clearly be on the side that I'm trying to represent today and share with you. Oh, well, one more time. <laughs> he can't stay away from that, just like me. So, critical anthropomorphism requires neuroscience, deep neuroscience, causal neuroscience. And that's what affective neuroscience attempts to do. It accepts the mind. Without the human mind, we could not progress, obviously. It has to have deep neuroscience, not just correlative neuroscience, but manipulating circuits, chemistries, those kinds of things. And it has to combine these with the study of behavior, but not the behavior of microswitches and Skinner boxes, but real behavior namely the stuff ethologists look at, what was built into the organism. And there are instinctual emotional circuits in the brain. And that's what that book was about. So here's the first time anyone generated an emotion by stimulating a specific part of the brain. And this was done by Walter Hess. Walter Hess, a Swiss physiologist, induced coherent anger-type responses from brain stimulation, electrical stimulation of the brain, of the central autonomic nervous system. The peripheral autonomic nervous system cannot be stimulated in this way to produce an emotion, even an emotional feeling. No one's done it. He got a Nobel Prize for working out the autonomic nervous system inside the brain in 49, but he called it sham rage. And in his autobiographical work, he said he regrets that decision. Why did he make such a mistake? He chose to make it because he did not want his work marginalized by the behaviorists. That's the history. So there are these sour spots in the brain, but there's also sweet spots. See the arch back and the cat in both pictures? But what's the difference? One's a snarling face, kind of looking up, the other's looking down. One's tail down, the other's tail up. The yeah, cat will never have its tail up that way if it is in a friendly social mood. So here's the impenetrable mystery. And uh, it is impenetrable with just words and external observations at a scientific level. But of course, all the people that believed that these things exist were correct. It's penetrable by neuroscience, especially if we share these ancient forms of consciousness with other animals, like this. So this is a dual aspect monism strategy similar to particle wave dynamics and physics, two ways to look at the same thing. So angry behavior reflects angry feelings. How do we know? Because every time you stimulate this angry behavior, that stimulation serves as a punishment for the animal. It's a fact. It's a 100% fact. It's a law of nature. Okay. Once you have a law of nature, what's the point in discussing it much further? Someone has to have a better hypothesis. No better hypothesis has come along in 50 years. So, I hate and I love, can one tell me why, Cachulus? 
we have to see these processes and levels of organization in the brain. I am only studying primary processes, nothing else. That's all I've been doing my whole scientific career. At least that's what I believe I've been doing. Joe Ledoux, fear learning, is studying a secondary process already. And there's gazillions of people in behavioral neuroscience doing that. And psychologists are forced to primarily study tertiary process, the wonderful complexities of these things in the real world. And of course, we have to consider all levels. The dual aspect monism strategy cuts the Gordian knot, I think definitively. And I think Darwin would find this sweet, just like he would find modern genetics sweet, even though he didn't know anything about genes, but he knew there were genules, genules as he called them. There was punctile inheritance of characteristics. He fathomed that. It wasn't just mixing like you're doing uh, brownies. <laughs> you know, there were discrete things that were being transmitted. He knew that. So, oh, thanks that by hate and I love, can one tell me how? <laughs> We can't, science cannot answer why questions. I mean, the last scientist to really answer these was Darwin. Uh, they have to be stories. We cannot look into the past. They have to be plausibility stories. What a scientist does, they never address why questions. It's always a how question. So, Descartes had one view, spooky. You know, mind is separate from matter. And Spinoza, his younger colleague, said, nonsense, it's a unified process. They both, mind is a reflection of matter. And I believe he was correct. Now we have cognitive neuroscience. I think Damasio and Joe Ledoux would be in that tradition. What do they say about affects classically? How about behavioral neuroscience? Jeffrey Gray, wonderful work. Edmund Rolls, beautiful work. Paul McLean, a profound scholar, and I join, try to join that last group. What do they say about emotional feelings? These guys say feelings are irrelevant. That's called ruthless reductionism. These folks say feelings are neocortical. Not a whit of evidence for it, even though the neocortex inhibits, regulates emotions, and can activate emotional processes by a thinking. So it all participates. Well, these folks said it was subcortical. And it's just a matter of lining up the evidence. The evidence is like a gorilla for the last one. That middle one is just but ignorant opinion. And the top one is misleading ourselves that cognit emotions are just cognitions in disguise. They interact, obviously, at the tertiary process level, but the primary process level is just affect. There's no reflection upon it. It's just pure experience. And that's what a little baby has, pure experience. And we deny, or some people still deny, that they feel pain during circumcision and things like that. That's an intellectual uh, dishonesty, and it's a moral travesty. It should not be tolerated. The little babies feel profound pain. And uh, you know, the animal data indicates that clearly. So how do you define an emotion? Ultimately, it's a neural dynamic, and the neural networks define it. And they're very complex. They've got intrinsic inputs. They coordinate physiological behavioral outputs. There's a lot of stuff coming into into the body, into the brain from the body, that's very important, including gating, selecting inputs. There's a percolation, it lasts longer than the precipitating circumstances. Cognitions, of course, instigate emotions. We all know that. Emotions also control how we think profoundly, and every clinician has to deal with it because it leads to all kinds of faulty views about the world because emotions are so self-centered. And, uh, you know, if we don't use these emotional powers correctly in our children, their upbringing, then we're making profound mistakes. And 
creating a world that we really don't want after it's all finished. Where's affect? The whole thing regulates affect, but you can take the top away and the affect remains. Affect is fundamentally an ancient subcortical process. So we even developed a personality scale for this. And the positive emotions are in red, and the negative emotions are in blue and dark. There are three of each. And there's also a tiebreaker that I didn't put up there, because we didn't include it in the personality test. But we decided to use an S word anyway. The seventh one is, of course, sex, lust. We put spirituality there instead because that's so important in psychiatric issues, it's so important in drug addictions. 12-step programs work better than any of the drugs that are coming on the market, and they will outlast the medicines. So you need social support. One reason people take these drugs is because they don't have the good feelings that you and I get from our social interactions. Drugs can simulate that because these circuits ride, these social processes ride upon matter, the matters of the brain and mind. So what are the consequences in the landscapes of child development? Seeking, these are words. The reason I capitalize the primary process is to emphasize that we are only talking about the primary process in capitals. It needs a special terminology. I'm talking about a neural network that has psychological properties. If we don't keep our words clean, all we have is endless arguments. Don't tell me, argue about any of the small letter vernacular words. Argue about the capitalized one. But it's probably the foundation, rage for irritability, resentment, hate, intermittent explosive disorders that so many of our kids are showing these days because they're not well regulated. Fear, anxiety, trepidation, worry certainly contributes to post-traumatic disorders, lust. These adolescents that don't know what to do with their lust, sexuality, eroticism, libido, desire, love, have to have an open conversation about touching, about feeling, and all these kinds of things. Care. This is the heart of the matter. Do we really care about these things? Oh, a mother is prepared by evolution to respond with these positive pro-social attitudes. Ultimately, I think empathy rides upon this emotion more than any other. There's sadness built into our brains because we are social creatures. And thank goodness for play. <laughs> you know, sources of joy. It's a subcortical process. We know that. In rats, we take the whole neocortex away and they play like dynamite. It's a proof that play is not a cortical process, even though we know it dramatically influences the cortex. And if we don't use play in clever ways where the joy is there, but we're a bit smarter and we know how to guide the play into pro-social avenues, we're not doing our job as a culture. And we are not doing it. I think we'll all agree. That's why we're here. So what are the consequences of these for child development, for seeking? Lots of goals that are life-affirming and educational, but fun, attract children to the very best human values and cultural uh, progressions. So we have to use the seeking system. That's the granddaddy of them all. Anger, this natural aspect of human life, when excessive, especially in kids, can shrink a child's opportunities, perspectives for optimal development. Chronic family strife can demoralize children, promote introversion, resentment, withdrawal from family life, and explosive disorders. Fear, it's essential that we minimize this, but they have to have a touch of it, obviously. It's perhaps too obvious to go into it, but we've got so many types of anxiety disorders. And now we shift to the social emotions. Uh, Kelly Lambert's wonderful Scientific American article, I think that's Kelly herself there, kissing her baby. 
this is the source of care. And the nine months of gestation are so critical for the child's life. You know, last week we had Time magazine with a wonderful pregnant woman uh, floating in space. <laughs> And, uh, you know, all the epigenetic effects that are occurring, the stressors, the stuff that can modify the child's life forever as well as transgenerationally. It's amazing research. So lust, uh, what do we do with that? I think we have to learn to incorporate coming of age again. Kids have lost this. There are no rites of passage anymore in our culture. They just do as they please. Our ki I think in the Pleistocene, that was not permitted in our species. Our kids no longer have any clear line between childhood, adolescence, and early adulthood. And of course, they're living with parents who also are full of lust and sexual desire and hopefully secure attachment. And in a sense, the child is okay as long as the parents are okay. That's simple enough. The kids don't need that much overwhelming attention that we presently give them. They'll do well if they know their parents are well. So one has to focus on the marriage as much as anything. Care, essential for secure bonding. Sadness, insecure attachments, they're horrible and they last for a lifetime. They lead to school phobias in kids, obviously, disposition for depression. Play. I think it promotes optimal development if watchful adults guide it properly. But they have to do it. We don't do it for them. Children have to do it. We spent a dozen years trying to get a play sanctuary going in America through NIMH. We've had no success. Uh, but we did do a feasibility study, and we learned a lot. I think we will reduce ADHD if we bring back real, physical, dynamic, joyful activity because it releases growth factors. We've done the genetics. Lots of growth factors are activated by play in the cortex, areas of the brain not needed for play itself. These are epigenetic effects. Why am I doing that? Oh, I forgot to go through my thing, so. Might as well emphasize those. There's lots of feelings. There's pleasures and pains of sensation that I'm not even touching on. Of course, all children need sensory pleasures. We've got homeostatic feelings, bodily hungers and thirsts. Of course, we have to protect our children from them and make sure that their diet is proper for proper growth. I'm just focusing on one third of the pie here. What an enormous pie. And who are studying these processes in a realistic psychological way in our culture? There's something wrong somewhere. This kind of work is not being encouraged. And effects we know emerge largely from these subcortical areas. They're regulated by cognitions. So here's uh, our primary process circuits. And let's focus on the lowest part of it because that's the most important part, the periaqueductal grade down in the midbrain. Why do I say it's most important? Because this area, the smallest amount of electrical juice produces the most powerful emotional response. And it's meaningful for the animal because the animal will treat it as a reward or punishment every time. It's a law of nature. The smallest amount of brain damage here will compromise consciousness. It has probably the most massive convergence of input from the rest of the brain. We've even asked, uh, what's the last part of the brain to die uh, at this level, low level? Higher areas die before lower areas. This just at this level, this is the last part of the brain to die. That's a long story, but that's the end result. So there's something like a core self here, the tradition of talking about a soul and you know, important kind of human issues. 
there is coherence. There's organismic coherence down here, and that's where the emotions are. So emotions grab us right at the center of our being. That's what the anatomy and that's what the functional studies show. So you might call it the core self. And a dual aspect monism, angry behavior reflects angry feelings. You can get intense anger from there. The emotional aspects arise from emotional action systems. That's what the evidence shows. Affect is not just sensory. Affect is also, as Colin says, inactive. You know, uh, the ancient primal motor systems have a feeling to them. That's what the evidence suggests. So we got to understand the foundations, and here's the layering of mind. Here's conditioning, instrumental and classical, that the fear conditioners study. They do not accept the primary process. They just call it the unconditioned response. That's called instinct. That's where the affect is. And then there's tertiary process, cognitions and stuff. That's a little baby. That's a pyramid. The cortex is empty at birth. It's tabula rasa. It's there to be programmed by society, family, culture, you know, teachers, everything. It is tabula rasa. There's no language instinct up there. There's no visual cortex up there. The visual cortex is programmed by subcortical processes. Karyanga Sur, MIT. Beautiful work. It's definitive. So, uh, obviously, they interact because there's lots of things in the world. So, a little squirrel wants food, but not to be food. This requires cognitive skills. So, as we grow up, these things seem to shrink. It's a deception. They seem to shrink because there's so much automatic learning. Automatic learning is unconscious. And then we humans have this vast storehouse of ideas, concepts. So the cortex really takes over. It's the emperor with only half the body clothed. <laughs> so here is one way to look at it, nested hierarchies. A square, primary, then you got bottom up learning, but the bottom gets embedded into the learning, and the learning gets embedded into the thoughts. So there are these nested hierarchies, and it might be easier to see it this way. So the red, the affect continues to percolate up in the brain, just like the visual system. It gets embedded in learning and then gradually in cognitions, complex mental processes. This stuff is deeply subcortical. The learning is largely upper limbic system, the basal ganglia, like amygdala, ventral striatum, and the neocortex comes on board through learning. So here's the original picture that I drew in 30-some uh, years ago to highlight the four emotions that we could all believe existed at that point. And uh, there was rage, there was the seeking system, fear. We mapped out the separation system, which is the source of social bonding to a substantial extent. It's obviously a multi-sensory phenomenon. Now we can add care, maternal care, uh, sexuality and playfulness. So there might be more, but I can't see anything clearly on the horizon. But these seven emotional processes, we have a basic anatomy from behavioral neuroscience. We also have piles of chemistries. And we ha don't have a tradition that sees how these systems percolate upward developmentally. There are no developmental psychologists yet doing that kind of work desperately needed in science. So I'm writing this book endlessly. Uh, it will be out next year, I promise. <laughs> Norton's on my ass, so to speak. <laughs> With a heavy whip. <laughs> Here's the seeking system drawn by like Ross Clark and 
1938. What a beautiful, wide, branching system. People call it the reward system. It's not the, it's, there's many rewards in the brain. This is one primary reward system, but it's not sensory reward. It is action, emotional reward. And for some reason, the field doesn't get it because they don't talk the lingo of emotions. It's an emotional system. Everything falls into place as soon as you shift your uh, framework in that way. Jim Olds, who discovered this system, was very open-minded. And, uh, you know, you can do experiments uh, that demonstrate that your desire to run for food here drops off before your desire to eat food. Oh, I don't know what happened there, but... Oh, there it went. Good. Too many buttons. So, animal still loves to suck down sucrose, but it will not run for the sucrose when you block this nucleus accumbens. So it's desire, it's not pleasure of sensation. That's definitive. I think people are beginning to agree with that. Oh, well. Okay. All the emotional systems sensitize. Okay? If you have excessive fear, you will become an excessively fearful individual. Uh, if you have excessive anger early on, you will become an excessively angry individual. Uh, these systems learn like muscles. They get stronger depending upon what's happened to them. And that's why separation distress is the gateway to despair and depression later in life. Here's sensitizing with amphetamine. And... Uh, an animal that's been given amphetamine likes amphetamine more. The red just indicates more desire for amphetamine, but also more desire for food, chasing food, more desire for sex, and Ritalin acts very similar to this. So we're giving our kids a drug that sensitizes their brain, perhaps. No one's done that experiment either. So this normally the system in adulthood says, I want it. Uh, and kids say, I want it. And in a sensitized animal, it says, I want it now. <laughs> it really pushes the animal into hyperdrive for materialism, so to speak. Let me just briefly focus on two of our favorite systems. The separation system here that uh, is the source of joy that where the foundation is the playfulness that naturally comes to the young ones and the separation distress system that we call the panic system because we think psychiatrically that is the panic attack all loss of sense of security the bottom falls out suddenly neurochemically and then you have a panic attack it's also a source of sadness and grief at low levels the human brain imaging is consistent with that. And Damasio did this wonderful 2000 brain imaging where all these circuits that we talked about for 30 years lit up when humans strongly felt these emotions of sadness, grief, joy, being happy, this one's anger and fear. All the reds matched up nicely. The cortex, the purples, are shutting down. So during intense emotions, you can't think straight. And uh, the cortex isn't as functional. So joy and sadness, the crying system. Here's the human separation call that has not been properly studied yet. I don't know why, but it hasn't. We mapped it out using electrical stimulation in guinea pigs and chickens, and the anatomy is the same, and the neurochemistries are the same. This means it's an ancient evolutionary process, and that's Damasio's picture of human sadness. We showed that this is modulated by opioids, one of the sources of addiction. If you don't have love, get a molecule that makes you feel okay. Suvieta showed that human sadness is a low opioid state, and uh, that uh, this circuitry 
is not as opioid rich in sadness and in depression also. So opioids were the first modulator of this process. Then we discovered that oxytocin was just as good as opiates. And now, of course, oxytocin is all the rage because it mediates social sexual bonding in adult animals also. I personally believe that good part of oxytocin still works by modulating opioids, but and prolactin is a wonderful separation distress modulator too. So the molecules of care, the molecules of nurturance feeding the baby are the molecules of attachment and this kind of love. So let's move to joy very rapidly so I don't take more than my time. Ah, uh, here's uh, the faces of joy across species. And uh, I think this has enormous consequences for child development. And we don't have it right, even though we're the culture of play. And, you know, we love those big guys crashing their heads on the Notre Dame football field. And my alma mater got socked by them <laughs> yesterday. Uh, you know, it's wonderful entertainment, uh, but we should not be encouraging that kind of play in our kids, in our young kids. We should be encouraging physical but pro-social play. And that doorway is wide open during the preschool years. They really just like to have social play without bullying and stuff. But uh, as Steve will show us, if you're just brought up with each other, adolescents or peer reared, you end up being bullies and nasties and kind of screwed up in the head in various ways. Uh, if a child has the proper kind of access to play, and we have to give them that access as a culture, and we no longer do, uh, the kids build up a drive that is so intense that sometimes, at least, we call it ADHD. Every medication that is used for ADHD reduces play in our animal models, every last one of them, you know? And that's part of the benefit. And those molecules sensitize the nervous system in all animal models. They change the nervous system powerfully and semi-permanently at least. So uh, what are we doing? You know, what are we thinking about as a culture? I keep saying to myself in the middle of the night, four o'clock when I wake up and say, ah! <laughs> That's a strange world. You know, why at four o'clock in the morning do the negative emotions prevail? <laughs> All of us, no one studied it yet. <laughs> Tell me that you wake up 4 o'clock and you're feeling, oh, man, that's fun, good time. <laughs> it's a law of emotion. You're in the trough, baby. <laughs> There's no way you can get the joy juices running. And who is studying, looking for the joy juices? Well, uh, my colleagues at uh, Evanston, uh, when I joined them 6 uh, or 12 years ago at this point, our goal was to look for joy juices in the brain. <laughs> Uh, has a possible, you know, discovery of new antidepressants mainly. And they've got one in phase two clinical testing right now. And NIMH has agreed to do the clinical trial with a new baby that probably the preclinical animal data is darn good. Uh, but I won't go into that. Uh, and they were here at the football game yesterday because Joe's a Notre Dame uh, PhD. So uh, the only thing uh, that we're missing or we have that the other animals don't have is propositional self-report. But that's not so important because uh, the functions of language are not really, as far as I can tell, to either speak the truth or to talk about your emotions usually. You need a special person, psychotherapist, 
who can coax you to talk about your emotions and see what the hell is your real problem that's under the surface of cognition, often caused by cognitions. We've turned out that rats play like the Dickens. Uh, no one had done real science on play when we got into the ball game because there was no standard model. And we developed a model that's as good as any behavioral model for any kind of emotional process. So now you could do pharmacology, brain lesions, you can work out the mechanisms. So we spent about 20 some years doing that. Rough and tumble social play. Uh, it's so easy to get, it's quite amazing, but we now know playful behavior reflects playful behavior. Why? Because we have a play sound, uh, ultrasonic kind of laughter type sound that the rats exhibit. And uh, that sincere indicate, indicator of I'm feeling fine, I'm feeling joyous, I'm feeling good. We can say that that's true because We've mapped, or Jeff Bergdorf in his dissertation, my last PhD student at Ohio, uh, every place in the brain where you generated a 50 kilohertz chirp, the animal would self-stimulate the circuit. Okay? That means positive affect is built into that circuit. And so we discovered this rat laughter and it turns out that opioids, this is an opioid map in the brain, this was the first drug that was discovered to facilitate play, uh, but only at low doses, little tickled doses of opiates. Uh, now, Luke van der Schoen at University of Utrecht has found that facilitating our own pot system in the brain, the endocannabinoids, uh, the marijuana-like system in our own brains is also facilitating play a little bit. I actually uh, did those experiments myself when it first came out in the mid-80s, and I was sure it increased play, but I just didn't have the right ecology to get that project done. Here's, here's how powerfully Ritalin reduces play. Okay, Here's normal, open are normal animals, and here they have eight days or nine days of Ritalin. And it, play goes down and stays down. And when you really talk to parents up close that didn't want their kids on Ritalin, but okay, you know, the system forced it upon them, usually their main complaint is, I don't like my child as much as I used to because they're not joyously engaged anymore with the family. Okay? They tend to be aloof. They tend to be more adult-like. They're attending, staring out a window at nothing. So, uh, and we have found that these doses sensitize the nervous system in these young animals. So, play, how do we bring it back? <laughs> Let them play with the other animals, for sure. <laughs> you know, every child that doesn't have a brother or sister ought to have a fun-loving pet uh, and you know, have that kind of attachment. And We try to facilitate that through our center, our uh, person-pet partnership pro program. And it starts very early, half a year of age. The baby's already chuckling. <laughs> So laughter takes a while to come in because we're all born preemies. The circuits aren't completely hooked up yet. And uh, then we can have tickle games. And a parent that doesn't have tickle games and doesn't know how to do that isn't doing parenting right. Uh, it's part of the ball game, I think, in the Pleistocene. Uh, I don't know if daddies did it more or mommies. Uh, how are we ever to know? But at this point, it's definitely daddy's job. <laughs> and uh, I did it with my own kids, and boy, did they tell me a lot about play and laughter. And looks like we can tickle rats, too. These T's are tickles. This is just a two-minute session. 
of these 50 kilohertz sounds. These are tickles. We can't use the word laughter, and we can't use tickling in our papers. That's verboten in a goose fashion of our science. And <laughs> that's not the way you tickle a rat. Uh, rat has to be free and engaged, and you tickle them two times. You can just wiggle your fingers like coochie coochie coo with a little child, and they will chirp away. So, but it's a skill that's learned. So Paul Clark at McGill, you know, uh, when I gave a talk there, I said, "Hey, Panksep, you know, our rats don't chirp when you, uh, you know, tickle them or whatever you do." I say, "No." Why don't you bring some of your rats here? And we're on the third floor of a building, and all the students and graduate students are, everyone is there waiting for me to fail. And I know a rat doesn't like to be taken to a strange place and tickled, especially by a total stranger. <laughs> so I'm putting my life on the, my career on the line. I said, bring them up, you know? We'll see whether I can tickle them. One animal after another chirped when I tickled them, OK? Everyone can't tickle a child, but a person who doesn't know how to do it should be trained how to do it. And if uh, they still can't get the skill, then they should be sent to Alan Shore, and he'll <laughs> teach them how to tickle a child. So, heterospecific hand play is okay. We call it happy hands. But yeah, you've got to have fun with uh, the current history in science. It's really bizarre. Here's the real sincere laugh. It's a frequency modulated kind of step function, or just the trill. Some have this step, but others are just little flat ones like that without the trill. That one's not a sincere laugh. That's kind of a nervous laugh. The animal goes into a new environment, goes, <laughs> you know, these monotonous ones. Checking out the social environment. Is anyone there that? there's possibility of interacting with positively or negatively. The animals like to listen to this sound if given the choice. The flat one, they do not listen to. So this is a positive reward. This is tickling their happy system as it comes in. So, you know, when we hear laughter, you know, at a carnival, everyone just heads toward the laughter. Say, oh, that's where the fun is. I think rats are the same. Here's the chirpy circuit. Uh, and this circuit, as far as we know, is underactive in depression. So a good research program in depression is getting these juices stronger in some way. No one's doing that. And with all the animal models of depression, no one's doing that, really. Puzzle. Play is not all good. Here's rat play, and these happy sounds go down during the half hour. And we did the first human play study and measured laughter also. It came down during half hour also, just like this. Uh, the complaints go up. So every parent knows that when kids play, the next thing that happens is someone complains eventually. That's part of the ball game. And parents ought to be taught that's part of the ball game. It's OK. That's when adult supervision is needed. That's when adult guidance is needed. That's where a parent or you know, someone in the school system on the playground, you know, the nurses that Plato talked about, the uh, people that should always be there so you know, bullying doesn't get reinforced. You know, bullying can be fun, uh, but only for one, not for both. So um, I think even these rats start bullying, and I think Steve will show us how peer-reared monkeys start to be bullies and stuff. So one needs play sanctuaries in our society, but those play sanctuaries need people on the side that only intervene when bad stuff happens, as it invariably does. And in our Bowling Green feasibility project, we saw that plenty of times. And you know the kids learn if their reward is going back for play. They learn fast. 
because they want the good stuff. And if I don't, if I have to stop my bad ways in order to get it, and you tell them like that, said, don't do that. That's not nice. You don't want to hurt Mary, do you? No. Well, don't do it again. Okay. No. Okay. You want to go play? Yeah. Don't do it then. Go play. You know, ping, 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 it's done. Oh, that's what they want. Well, I get it. <laughs> we don't do that for our children. Uh, so this side is also preferred if you do a condition place preference. And if the first 15 minutes was on high chirpy, the second 15 minutes, the animal avoids. Doesn't want to go back there. You bet. Okay, so how about brain? We've kind of mapped out the circuits in various ways, but we're really interested in what beneficial effects are in the brain. And it looks like growth factors are activated. So the first one we did was in Huda Akil's lab uh, doing uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, one of the granddaddies of this large family. And yes, indeed, in a couple of brain areas, BDNF was elevated significantly in the frontal cortex, in the amygdala. And then we went on a search for unknown candidates. And this is, uh, the paper just came out uh, a couple of months ago. Jeff Bergdorf was the lead on this project. And we did a small microarray study where, you know, I chose the 1,200 genes that we would look at and uh, they did the work. <laughs> and uh, lo and behold, uh, after half an hour of play like you saw, but we had to throw away piles of tissue that we'd harvested in order to get only the animals that showed 50 kilohertz chirps. And there are some that for half an hour stay happy. And we obviously didn't want happy and bad stuff mixed together. So we threw away tons and harvested only happy brains. <laughs> and you've got to play this game that way. Otherwise, it's a mixed bag. And we uh, looked at the frontal executive areas at one hour and the sensory perceptual areas back here at one hour and also the same at six hours, so frontal and posterior. Out of the 1,200 genes, about one-third were significantly shifted one way or the other. And of the 400-some, there were 186, 38% that were turned on both front and back. And at six-hour time point, gene expression is way down, but still a lot of frontal, a lot of posterior and 17 that were left. So what, what does one do at this point? One sighs and says, oh, if we had done the whole brain, we wouldn't even know how to think about anything. Uh, which one are we going to target as for functional studies, as a target for identifying a happy a luteron, a happy joy juice? And uh, of course, you take this overlap area, and you're already winnowed down from 186 to 17. So we simply said, out of those 17, which gene was upregulated, not downregulated, but upregulated and to the largest extent? And the answer was insulin like growth factor one. And it the protein was down at one hour of play, meaning the animal, when it was playing, it was using this molecule actively in the cortex. That's not needed for play. This growth factor is absolutely essential for infantile development. Without this growth factor, we all die. <laughs> we can't survive without it. Uh, when you grow older, the people that have high circulating levels of this still tend to be happier people. Okay? So the human work has been done for a while. Why? Because this was the first growth factor ever discovered in the body. <laughs> and uh, at uh, six hours, it was still upregulated, but now 
the protein was significantly elevated. So play had turned on the gene and produced the product. So what Jeff did was the real hard work, which is doing the psychological work or behavioral work, to see if it really produced a happier animal. And yes, I won't show you the data, it's too late. The animals were more chirpy, the animals were more courageous in open fields, the animals uh, showed uh, increased pl playfulness and uh, you know, it's one of our targets as a possible antidepressant. But it'll never come to market. Why? Because this growth factor also allows your tumors to grow if you've got cancer. So if you had a molecule that facilitates it, there's a catch-22. So what do we want from our kids? We want a better frontal lobe function. We want them to stop, look, listen, and feel, to reflect, to imagine, have empathy, creative play that gives us flexibility and well-focused mental attitudes. These are programmed by life. They're not in our genes. And play is one of the gifts of nature to help program this. And it's hard to get any research for play out of NIH or NSF. But, you know, this uh, gargoyles at Utrecht, and I take it from Utrecht because uh, NIH finally funded a big play study in Holland. <laughs> Luke van der Schoen got a wonderful large, he's a wonderful guy, he deserves it. Second generation of play, I love it. And now uh, here's Utrecht Cathedral with these wonderful gargoyles, half human, half animal. Uh, sorry, you can't see that, but this guy's holding his head. You know, oh, who smacked me on the back of my head? What a human being can do is they put a shield, a helmet on their head. So it's wonderfully symbolic. So the only conclusion I really have is humans and other mammals share the same basic emotions. How could it be otherwise? Uh, these systems are concentrated subcortically. The only access we have is in animal models. The animal models have to be used with a new sensitivity that we don't really have in the field. And here's Friedrich Nietzsche. He says the moralities are merely a sign language of the affects. I think he had it straight on that one. <laughs> so anyway, thank you, and thank you for organizing the conference.